chapter number nine, I was starting to get a headache because I was studying tonight, so I put my glasses on and it seemed to help. So I have a hard time with the glasses thing when I'm doing it this way, but I don't want to get a headache. So I, when I look up at you guys, it's all fuzzy. But when I look right here, it's like wonderful. So I'm not sure how to navigate that moment. So you guys will have to be pleasant to me, that's all. I was thinking, you know, when Sims playing the piano over here, you know, there's, there's people that can play on the piano, and there's a few of us who can play on the piano. I'm not one of them, okay? I'm good at the radio, and that's about it. And, uh, but then there's people who play the piano, right? So there's those who can play on the piano, and then there's those who play the piano. And that was people who didn't play the piano, you know what I mean? So they kind of tell the piano what to do as they go along. Is that an arrangement you have memorized, or is that something you just played off the top of your head? I'm going to have that in heaven one day. Isn't that a reason to look forward to heaven? <laughs> I've never had that much patience for anything. But I am realizing that if, um, you know, if, if I'm going to be preparing my kids for missions work and future ministry, I need to teach, help them learn how to, how, how to have uh, instrumental, you know, quality of some kind. So we're, we're talking about, you know, what to do. We're, we're inspired by Mr. Vincent's ministry with the ukulele. We've been thinking about that one. Jeremiah is going to be around the world. A ukulele is a good one to have with you. It's easy to carry. You know. Uh, we also talked this afternoon about the flugelhorn. That's another one. It's better than the trumpet. The trumpet's too loud and obnoxious, uh, personally. But the flugelhorn's much softer sound. But uh, the ukulele kind of strikes me as the right one. But we'll have to ask God for that. And see what's going on. Um, chapter 9 of the book of Nehemiah. We're back here in the book of Nehemiah. And chapter 9 is probably... Oh man, this is about three years worth of material, and we're going to go through it in the next 30 minutes. So you'll have to bear with me. I know that it's going to seem like a, a, a rabbit race going through this, but um, this is, man, this is it. Let's read the first three verses together, then we'll pray, and then we'll, we'll talk about some things that are going on here. Now in the 20 and 4th day of, the month of, the, uh, of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their father. And they stood up in their place and read the book in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day. And then another fourth part they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Let's pray. I think we'll do that here this evening. Father, thank you again for uh, the book of Nehemiah and how it's been such a help to all of us. And Lord, we for your blessing, your encouragement, your wisdom to be here tonight for our own life, personally, and as we look to you to guide and direct our time. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we've been looking through the book of Nehemiah, and we remember that along the way, it was the story of Nehemiah coming to back to Jerusalem, um, and uh, the, the temple had been rebuilt, but now it's getting the walls up, and and if you remember back into chapter number 6, and uh, uh, I think it was chapter 6, yep, chapter 6 and verse 15, the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elu, in 50 and 2 days. And, uh, you know, one thing that I'm being struck by a lot in my Bible is that what we think takes an extended period of time to get done, the Bible seems to tell us, no, it should be really fast. Uh, let me give you another illustration. So they, they built this huge wall in 52 days, okay? 52 days. Now think about that. That's less than two months. And they gathered together, they worked together, and they got this, they got this massive project done. And uh, praise God that it, that it took just a shorter period of time. And again, just confronting the reality that oftentimes we think that you know, the things that God does, it's just, it just takes time. We just got to work it out. We just got to, we just got to sit there and, and, and just, and, and I think really the only thing that I find that takes time in God's word is when God is dealing with hard, stiff-necked people, is working that out of them. 
let me illustrate. It's actually in the text here in chapter number nine. But you know, when, when God was working with the children of Israel and they got them out of uh, the land of Israel, uh, out of the land of Egypt, and uh, His plan was to get them right into the promised land. But you'll remember in, the, in, in Numbers there when they, I think it was chapter thirteen, uh, right there, they uh, they sent the men in to spy out the land. They came back. They brought the evil report. Right, ten were bad, two were good. Right, the two is the name of the two are. Caleb and Joshua, and the name of the other ten are. Nobody remembers the, the men who came to get back with the evil report because they weren't men of faith. God's plan for the children of Israel was to leave Egypt, cross the Red Sea, right, and go right into the Promised Land. Right. That was God's plan. But because the children of Israel heard this evil report, they decided to say no. And it took over 40 years to purge the generation of unbelief out of the people of Israel. 40 years, that's a long time. It wasn't God's plan for them to spend 40 years in the wilderness just wandering around for no reason. That wasn't his plan. His plan was to get into the promised land, start conquering, start taking over, start doing the things that they were supposed to do. And then if you read Joshua, you'll see the conquering of the land over and over and over and over again. Right? So you'll see that stuff. So when it comes to the work of God and the things that God's doing, really the, the, the speed at which God works is pretty miraculous. If we look in the New Testament, right? If we look in the New Testament, man, they're biting my eyes. It's hard not to listen to people. But, uh, um, when you look in the New Testament, you see the rapid gospel advance happening. It didn't take 400 years to reach Jerusalem. At the pace the gospel spreads today, Jerusalem may have never been reached. The uttermost may have never been reached. But it, it, it happened in such a short window of time. And you'd say again, oh, Pastor, it's the apostles. You know, it's this. It was a special time. It was a unique time in history. You know, all this stuff. None of that is true. Those are all excuses that we make for how we think God should work. And the reality is the hard thing that God is trying to work through is our unbelief and our, our unwillingness to respond to God's work. Our unwillingness to yield. And, and here in chapter number 8 um, of Nehemiah, the work went from the external work of the wall and getting that built, and then starting into chapter 7 and getting into chapter 8, the work now is upon and chapter 8 lays out some of those revival truths. And again, we just read chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. There, the, uh, um, the reality of revival. And I wrote down that list here on my own sheet. But notice this list that, uh, uh, that the people here are now gathering together. Life has changed for these people. There's a revival happening. And again, we have to remember this word revival is not something we use in the context of lost people. Lost people don't need revival. They've never got revived, so to speak. Yeah. Revival is life again, or re-life, okay? You can't be re-lifed if you've never been lifed. <laughs> right. So lost people need an awakening. Christians need revival, okay? Yeah. And, and we see here really the, the things that changed in their life that evidence the reality of a reviving. Okay? What did they do? Um, uh, they assembled themselves, verse 1 of chapter 9, with fasting. All of a sudden, they're fasting again. They're coming together uh, to forsake whatever thing they're fasting from. Probably at this point, work and food for setting aside opportunity to worship God. Okay, And uh, um, fasting is a good thing. Uh, by the way, in the New Testament, it's assumed that Christians fast. Did you know that? Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount, when ye fast, not if ye fast. Just like he said, when ye pray, not if ye pray. When ye give your, uh, uh, your offerings, not if you give. And so there, there is this reality that, listen, if, if, if we're going to have uh, what we're expecting God to do in the New Testament, if we're looking for uh, uh, the blessing of heaven, then our gathering together needs to be 
different. It needs to be a gathering together, not of just trying to reform the old ways of doing things. We need to come together in a new way. And one of the new ways would be fasting. Uh, I have heard from well, lots of Christians in my uh, Christian experience that they never fast. Never. And that needs to change because uh, if we're going to see God work and if we're going to see revival and if we're going to see the things that we, we believe are in the New Testament, then my friends, it, it can't be the same gathering together Something needs to change. And one of the simplest ways to set aside an opportunity to meet with God is to fast. Right. Fast from your television. Amen. Right? Yeah. Some of us have a television in multiple rooms of our house and have it on just for the sake of noise. Unplug those bad boys, right? Mm -hmm. And turn them off. Get rid of the noise. Some of us, uh, you know, love to sit on our phones. I love to scan the news. I love to see what's going on, especially when the, when Roe versus Wade breaks. I love to see, you know, what the crazy world is doing. You know, it's okay to take time in your week. And even, if, listen, you can be the busiest person in here with the craziest schedule. You can still fast. Right. You can still take time uh, to set aside an opportunity to be with the Lord. You know, fasting just makes a point between you and the Lord that you're serious about getting a hold of Him Amen. and hearing His voice. It's okay to fast. In fact, we should be fasting. Right. Amen. Notice here it says, uh, the children of Israel says, uh, assemble themselves with fasting and with sackcloths and the earth upon them. Okay? Wouldn't that be a strange Everybody showed up and they got their, you know, their sackcloths, dark colored clothing, sort of like, you know, something weird. And they all walked in with piles of dirt on their head and shoulders, having not eaten. These people were troubled in their spirit. They were burdened about something. You see, God had opened their eyes to the reality that the way they had been living between them and the, year, and the generation before them was wrong, and they wanted it changed. They, back in chapter number 8, the word of God had been opened up to them, and, and in verse number 9, Nehemiah, which, uh, uh, and the Levites taught the people and said unto the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God, mourn not nor weep, for all the people wept when they had heard the words of the law. They heard God's word, and they saw their life, and the drastic contrast of what they saw in God's word and what they were doing in their life was so convicting that it caused them to weep. It says that they, 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 they assembled themselves not to come together to eat, not to come together to hang out or to a sporting activity, uh, not to hang out and watch the world, to be entertained by the world. They didn't come together uh, just because it, it was something that they did every Sunday or Wednesday, or they didn't come together for a, a program or an activity. They came together because they were broken. They were God's people. And their life didn't reflect their God. And they mourned and they wept and they fasted. And they put on sackcloth and they put dirt on their heads. Maybe I should try that and see what happens. Verse 2. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers. They, 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 they separated themselves from the world. They cut the world off. No more Facebook. No more news feed. No more new 
newspapers? Just God's people getting together before their God to right this relationship, to deal with the issues that stand between them and God. Shutting out all the voices, all the influences, all the distractions. I've got a lot of desires in my heart. Uh, I mentioned this morning, if you were here, there was a big buck that ran across my field. A big one, especially for this time of year. And my heart desires to shoot that thing when it gets really big. Um, I have to call neighbors, farmers, to help me work the fields on my property because my little lawnmower can barely cut the grass, more or less turn up any dirt. And I really want a, a, a tractor. And as my wife, she'll tell you, I talk about it regularly, figuring out how to work it into the budget. <laughs> but more than I want those things, I'm finding that my life does not match my Bible. And if having those things means that I'm going to continue to live in the condition I am, then I don't want those things anymore. Listen, if, if having a tractor or having another mount on my wall or, or having a house out in the country or or, or whatever it is stands between me and God, then listen, then my priorities are messed up. There's something broken. There's, there's distractions in my life. There's things that have caught the, caught the attention of my heart that, that should never catch the attention of my heart as a Christian. I, I, I'm often reflecting on the fact that, you know, I got saved out of the life of drugs and alcohol. I, I, God delivered me. I was, I was on a... Sh on a train, I was going to be shipwrecked for eternity, separated from God. And God, in his mercy, I, I read Paul's uh, chapter 1 of Galatians, I, I read his testimony, and, and, and God, and, and he talks about God's mercy, and he talks about God's blessing, and he talks about how God just loved him enough to save him. And I'm thinking, man, that's me. And here I stand and I look around my life and I think, what is a distraction? What has separated me from God? What is stranger am I embracing in my life? These people made a point of saying, get, get, get these things away from me. I can't, I can't have these things right now. Right. You see, my relationship with God is messed up. And if these voices or these distractions or any of this stuff gets in the way of that, then, then, then what's the point of this all? They separated themselves from strangers, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Isn't this fascinating? They didn't need to air their dirty laundry out to the to the strangers, but they, when they got together, they were honest and open with one another, right? It would be good for us to be honest and open about our sin. Right. You know, often we think, you know, Pastor, I think you need to be careful. We don't, you know, we don't want to air our dirty laundry. Listen, I, I know there's carefulness. And I'm not telling you to stand up and confess, you know, uh, things that people shouldn't hear. But as a congregation, it would be good to stand up as a voice and say, listen, we are complacent in our gospel obligation to our community and to the communities around us. It would be good for us in, in this day and age, to look around at the world and say, we have fed and gotten fat off the things of God. We have tasted and seen that God is good. And instead of becoming more uh, excited about the things of God and it driving us into a greater understanding of great commission ministry, we have sat back 
on the other side of the river and suck lemonades while somebody else did the work. It, it is good for, for, for and cleansing for a church to separate itself from the world and to confess its sin. I, I know I, I say this, and it, it, and it ruffles people's feathers, but listen, if a building stands between us and being right with God, what would you rather have today? Is, 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 a, is, a, is the brick and mortar more, uh, uh, more essential to the identity of a church? Or is it having the living God manifesting his presence among us in a garage at somebody's house? Think about it for a minute. We have traded uh, the presence of God, the reality of God, the work of God. For, for, for complacency. For programs. Listen, it's, it's not just Bethlehem Baptist Church. Listen, it's a, it's, a, it's a cultural problem amongst our churches. Notice in verse number three, and, and they stood up in their place. Not only did they stand up and Confess their sins. Listen, they didn't hide under a under a, a you know a head down, eyes closed invitation. They stood up for everybody to see, and they stood up in their place and they read the book of the law. They got up and God's word became predominant. It became the voice that spoke to them. The Levites here, as we'll see in verses four and five. Uh, the Levites, and they named them, and they, and they began to read, and, and, and we're going to read through some of this here, here tonight. I, I hope you're okay. I'm not a good reader, as you know, but uh, we're, I'm going to do my best to read through, read through this. There's a lot of verses. But I want to go through, this is a historical account of how Israel interacted with God, and I, I want you to catch a few things as we go through this. This is what revival looks like. Unashamed by, uh, by uh, making spiritual decisions. Unashamed by uh, 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 setting aside the things of the world to get your attention on God. Unashamed to say, God, this is what stands between you and me. Um, my wife's been listening to a, uh, a podcast, and uh, I think it was a podcast. I wish she heard this. And we were talking about, you know, when our kids, when we work with our kids, and, we, you know, when they, when they have to deal with some, you know, issue in their life, and, and it's not just going to somebody and saying, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's specifically talking about why you're sorry. Why are you sorry? Repeating that thing so that you're verbalizing the reality of what happened in that moment. Bringing, some, bringing a name or a truth to that moment is so helpful than just kind of brushing over with the general, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, thank you. No, no, what are you sorry for? What happened in that moment? What are we dealing with in that situation? And, and that's really what's going on here as, as these people are, they're, they're not just saying, I'm sorry, God, I, we've not been living right. No, they're, they're confessing sin. Homologeo, New Testament confession. They're saying the same thing as God. They're, they're making specific points along the way. They're, they're looking at their life through the eyes of God, you know, because we stand before him with no excuse, my friends. Right. The, 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 we're going to get to heaven one day. You and me. And you won't be able to say, well, Pastor Weber never did this. Or Pastor Weber did that. Or Pastor Weber, his wife. Let me tell you about her. She did da 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 Or those kids. They are some of the biggest rascals. <laughs> and I, I mean, look at them. <laughs> we won't have that privilege of that moment, folks. Because we're all going to stand. Individually. Right. Amen. And the Lord's going to say, but I talked to you about this. Why didn't you say the same thing as me? I wanted to revive you. I was ready to work. I cried with you. Verse 6. Thou, even thou, Thou 
has made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all the things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. Thou art the Lord, the God, who didst choose Abram, and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, and givest him a name of Abraham, and foundest his heart faithful before thee, and madest a covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites to give it, I say to his seed, and hast performed thy words, for thou art righteous. Did you notice that? God keeps his word. Amen. Why? Because he's the Lord. Right. He's the one that created this whole thing. You and me and everything. He put it all together. He spoke and it was done. He is somebody who is faithful when he speaks it. It's true. It's done. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That's true. Every single time. Call upon me. I will answer thee. That's true. Amen. If thou shalt confess thy sin, and, uh, and, uh, shalt confess and forsake thy sin, and... Uh, and I'll cleanse thee. And I'm paraphrasing that whole section in 1 John. That's true. Every single time. Verse 9. And, and did see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and hurts their cry uh, by the Red Sea. Think of that. They're standing at the Red Sea and, and then they're pinned in, they're hemmed in by uh, Pharaoh's army. They're coming at them. They've got nowhere to go. They, if they go into the Red Sea, they're done. Okay, It's not just some shallow water that they just could have went over. Otherwise, they would have been able to escape. They were hemmed in. There was nowhere for them to go. Right. And these people cried out. Why? Because God could hear them and they knew it. Can God hear you? And showed us signs and wonders upon Pharaoh and all the servants and all the people of his land, for thou knewest that they dealt proudly against them. So didst, uh, so didst thou get thee a name, as it is this day. And thou didst divide the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and their persecutors thou threwest into the deeps as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, thou uh, ledest them in a day by a cloudy pillar, and in the night by a pillar of fire, to give them light by the way wherein they should go. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, and true laws, and good statutes, and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them with precepts, and statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant, and gavest them bread, of heaven for hunger, and brought us them uh, forth water from out of the rock for their thirst, and promised them that they should go and to possess the land which thou had sworn to give them. Okay, pause for a minute. Think about all the miracles we just read. Manna from heaven, water from a rock, dividing the sea, delivering them from a trained military machine. Miracle after miracle after miracle after a miracle. And then you read verse 16 and it just blows your mind, doesn't it? But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments and refused to obey. Uh, and neither were mindful of the wonders that thou didst among them and hardened their necks and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return their bondage. It's fascinating. They saw these major things God did. He, they, but still, I don't care about that stuff. Who cares about that stuff? I don't care. It doesn't matter. Well, let's keep reading. That thou art a God ready to pardon. Praise God. Amen. Gracious and merciful and slow to anger. Remember that. Remember this second part. Great kindness and forsookest them not. Forsookest them not. He didn't say, okay, listen, 
fine, if that's the way you're going to be, then I've got no time for you. Listen, that's me. That's the flesh. The flesh that says, listen, listen, you, you can't get on board, you can't be a part of this, I and mean, i got no time for you. Listen, if you're going to constantly do this, i got no time for you. That's how we deal with our kids, right? That's how we deal with our disciples. That's how we deal with people at church. Oh, you know, they, they said this. i got no time for them. I'm going to get rid of them. I ain't got time for them. So-and-so offended me. I ain't got time for you. Get out of my face. I don't got time for you. But that's not what God does. Look, at these people, God revealed himself in majestic, overwhelming ways, just like he does to us. But they, in their refusal to obey, neither were they mindful of his wonders. They were rebellious. They would rather have a human leader that turns them back to bondage than to have God, the God of heaven. But God, what did he do? He didn't forsake them. He was gracious. He loved them. Verse 18, yea, and when they made them a molten calf and said, this day God, that uh, thy God hath brought thee up out of Egypt and hath and wrought great uh, provocations, yet in, in thy uh, manifold mercies forsookest them not. There it is again in the wilderness, and the pillar of uh, cloud departed not from them day by day, by day, uh, to, to lead them in the way, neither did the pillar of fire by night uh, to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not the manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. So even in the midst of their rebellion and, and, and their unwillingness, uh, again, they're just rehearsing this for these people. Why? Because this is what revival is. We're, we're looking back and seeing how God worked. We're embracing the fact that we can so identify with these moments. And we don't want to be in that position again. We don't want to be in, in verse 16 and 17. We don't want to be there. Uh, we want to be in verses 1, 2, and 3. We want to be in a place where we're standing for the God of heaven. We're lifting up holy hands. We're fasting. We're praying. We're separating ourselves from the world. But you know, listen, we've got to go back. We've got to remember these things. Look, notice in verse 21. Yea, 40 years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing. Their, their clothes waxed not old. Their feet swelled not. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and didst divide them into corners so that they possessed the land of Shahan and the land of the king of Heshbon and the land of uh, Og, the king of Bashan, and, and their children also multiplies that thou, uh, uh, as the stars of heaven, and broughtest them into the land concerning that which thou hast promised to their fathers that they should go in to possess it. Now we're into the promised land, and, and the children of Israel are multiplying like the stars of heaven as God promised to Abraham. Didn't he? So the children went in and possessed the land. And now they crossed over the Jordan under the leadership there of, of Joshua, right? Uh, he, he, that generation passed away of unbelief, and now it's a generation of faith. And they're going to go in, and, and they're going to possess the land. And thou subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave us to them their, their lands and, and, and their kings and their people of the land, and that they might uh, do with them as they would. And they took strong cities and the fat of the land, possessed houses full of all the goods, and dig, uh, wells digged, and vineyards, and olive yards. And the fruit trees in, the, in abundance, so they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. They were loving it. The blessing of God, this is wonderful, this is what it's like with God's blessing on my life. Nevertheless, verse 26, they were disobedient, rebelled against it, and cast thy law behind their backs and slew uh, thy prophets, which testified against them, to turn them to thee. And they wrought great provocations. Did you, did you read that? They got into the land, enjoyed the blessings of God, and when God, uh, when they turned their back on God's word, and, the, and the, the reason why they got to this place, God, in his mercy, sent them preachers. To <laughs> Wake them up and say, this isn't the right thing. You know what they did to those preachers of God? God's people, you know what they did to the preachers? They killed them. Because they'd rather sleep. They'd rather live and die in the promised land, not having to take any more steps forward. They were content and complacent. 
And God said, no, we're not done. This isn't the end. We're going to keep moving forward. You can't live like this. Get out of here. What did God do? Well, God did what he asked to do. He's got to wake them up. And how does he do that? How do you do that to a group of people who just are unwilling to move, who are stiff-necked, who are hard-hearted, who are unwilling to move forward? What do you do? Verse 27, therefore thou didst uh, delivers them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them. And in a time of their trouble, when, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And according to thy manifold, look at their just mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the uh, hand of their enemies. That's the judges, right? That's the time of judges. All along, any time they would cry to God, God's there, right? Why? Because he never forsook them. It wasn't God's plan to destroy them. It was God's plan for them to step into the reality of his presence and live in this condition of revival for extended periods of time, not just for a moment, not just for a generation, but forever. But after they had rest, verse 28, they did evil again. Therefore thou leftest, uh, therefore th leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that uh, uh, they had to do uh, dominion over them. And th th honestly, I think this is in, in, in a very spiritual way. This is where we're at today. God says, "Fine, you want to be dominated by by uh, by the enemy. What can I do?" You want to be dominated by pornography? I'll let pornography destroy your life. You want to be dominated by uh, bitterness, by anger, by frustration? Go ahead. I will let them destroy your life. That's not my plan for you. But if that is your choice, I will let it happen. I have to. I can't force you. He never forced these. Listen, along the way, God could have forced the children of Israel to do anything. He could have forced them. But he didn't. Because he wanted them to make a willful decision to turn to him. Amen. Right. So that uh, they had dominion over them, yet, uh, we're in verse 28, uh, when they returned, they cried unto thee, and thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies. That word mercy just keeps coming up, coming up, coming up. Praise God for his mercy! Yeah. Oh! And thou, and, and testifies thou against them that Thou mighty, uh, mightest bring them again into the, uh, to the, to thy law, unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not to thy commandments, but sinned against uh, thy judgments. Which, if any man do, he shall, uh, he shall live in them. Withdrew the shoulder and, and, and hardened their neck and would not hear. Preachers preached. God's voice was being heard, but they wouldn't respond. They wouldn't respond. They wouldn't respond. Yet, verse 30, many years didst thou forbear them, and testified again them by thy spirit and in, in, uh, in thy prophets. Yet they would they not give ear. Therefore thou gavest them, gave, gave us them, gave us thou them unto the hand. Over and over again through that history of the children of Israel, we see that God is merciful, that he is gracious, and he never, ever forsook them. No matter how hard their heart, no matter how rebellious they became. And, and listen, there was a time there early on in the history of Israel where God needed a generation of faith. He needed a generation to go into the promised land. And he allowed a generation to die in the wilderness. That was God's mercy. And these people, in many ways, live on the mercy of God. Right. Yeah. Mercy is, is something you get that you don't deserve. We don't deserve God's mercy. He right. gives it anyway, right? These right. people didn't deserve God's mercy, but they got it anyway. That's no place for a Christian to live. We should live in God's grace. Yeah. We should be living and tapping into the the grace of God to enable us to live the kind of life that pleases God every day. 
Not just coming back as, as, as disobedient, as uh, 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 rebellious children on a regular basis saying, Lord, I know you wanted me to talk to that person today, but I just didn't do it. You're living on God's mercy. And praise God, he's a merciful God. Verse 31 changes. Everything changes in verse 31. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. Amen. Listen, there are so many precious, wonderful verses in God's word. That ranks among some of the top. And it's hard to say which ones are at the top, but that's one of them right there. Okay. All of us can identify with that verse. <laughs> and that should be a verse that all of us should have memorized. Verse 32. Now therefore, our God, the great and mighty and terrible God, who keepest covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, or our fathers kept the law, nor hearkened unto thy commandments and thy testimonies, wherewith thou didst testify against them. For they have not served thee in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness thou gavest, uh, that thou gavest to them, and in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them. Neither turn they from their wicked works. Behold, we are servants this day. And for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof, and the good uh, thereof, behold, we are servants in it. It's no longer their land, it's our land. And look at verse 37, and it yielded much increase unto the kings who now has set over us. kings of the land that have been oppressing them. Why? It, it's, it's, it's no longer. They're not bearing the fruit of it. They're not eating off the fat of the land anymore. It, it, it's going on to the other people. Also, they have dominion over our bodies, over our cattle, at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of all of this, we make sure uh, a sure covenant and write it and our princes and Levites and priests seal unto it. That is an absolutely phenomenal passage of Scripture. They're saying everything that happened to our fathers in the past, everything that happened in the history of, of our nation in the past is happening to us right now. We're experiencing it. And it's not because it's a generational issue. It's because we made a choice to do wickedly. It's because we made a choice to sin. And the blessings we should be enjoying, the heathen are enjoying. <coughs> they are they're controlling our land. Notice in verse 37, they have dominion over our bodies. They have dominion over our cattle. At their pleasure. And we are great. those things are important for you and for me. Okay. To remember a couple of things. Number one, don't live in God's mercy. Praise God for his mercy. But you have God's word. You can walk in light every single day, accessing grace to live out an abundant Christian life. Amen. You 
don't only have God's word. You have the enablement of God himself living on the inside of you. Don't live in a confessional Christian experience. Live in a, in a Christian experience, and we talked about this morning, where you're following the Lord and leader of God, and he's enabling you to live an abundant Christian life. Right. God's plan for you, too, is not uh, live good, then fall, confess, and the cycle of judges. That's not God's plan. Okay, too many of us live in this emotional calamity that somehow it's okay for us to get excited about something, fall down on our face, confess it to God, get back up, and, and live okay on the mount for a few more days, and then fall off for a week or three, and then get back up and live up there for a couple of days and then fall off. That's not God's plan. The abundant Christian life is a moment by moment in an extended time of walking with God. It was never God's plan for them to go into the wilderness. Because getting out of the wilderness takes such an extended period of time. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Paul goes to great lengths to articulate in Nehemiah chapter number 9, Psalm 78, and recapture all those stories. Now these things were written for our examples. To the intent, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, as they some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them were also tempted, uh, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for example. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We need to remember God's work in the past and his mercy. Amen. So that it changes our personal life and our future with God. We don't have to live like them. That's the admonishment. Don't do those things that they did. You have the Spirit of God. You have the fellowship of believers. <laughs> you have the book of God. You have way more than they could have ever have had. These, these, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. They had, they had the writings of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament. That's all they had. Obviously, they had a pillar. They had a cloud. Uh, they had a priest. They had some of those things, but not like we have today. Right. And there's coming a day, my friend, when we will all stand before the Lord for these things. Revival is what we need. Setting aside the things of the world, confessing our sin, making God's word a preeminent in our life, fasting, and sackcloth and ashes. That's what Nehemiah is calling the people. It's one thing to restore a wall. It's a whole nother to get your life right with God. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the privilege of gathering together around the word of life. We thank you that tonight your desire for us is the abundant life. Lord, you did not die tonight uh, for us to have uh, a, a life of, of constant correction from you. Thank you that you love us enough to correct us. But Lord, you, you died to give us a life of your presence. And I want to thank you, Lord, here tonight uh, for your blessing and your encouragement. I want to thank you for your word. Lord, the enemy comes in to steal from us, Lord, that walk with you. He's a liar and he's a murderer. And Lord, he's gotten a hold of our heart. He's gotten a hold of our mind. He's tricked us into a religious experience. But Lord, what, what you're looking for is a personal, intimate relationship that day to day affects us. Thank you, Lord, today that we can walk with you and talk with you. And we can experience your hand of blessing. Lord, I'm asking you here tonight to work in our hearts. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And just by way of, of conversation here tonight, a prayer for me.
say, God's working in my heart here tonight, Pastor Weber, about walking with him, getting out of the cycle that the judges live in, taking the uh, taking uh, the rebuke of Scripture, the admonishment of Scripture, get out of that cycle of, of constantly living in failure and barely ever getting up to having daily victory. Pastor Weber, would you pray for me? Is there anybody like that here tonight that would just mention, thank you, yes, thank you, thank you. Anyone else here tonight? Yes, thank you. Anyone else? I'll join in too, so many. Father, I, I uh, want to thank you for the night for the acknowledgement of these men, Lord, whose hearts are tender before you. Uh, Lord, I'm just going to lift them up in prayer here tonight. I'm going to ask for you to work. Lord, I, I know heaven's open right now, and you're attentive unto this prayer. This is your church, and these are your people. Lord, you didn't die for, these, for this building. You didn't die for this property. You died for these, your people. And you love them in a way that we could we can't even grasp at the moment. But Lord, we're asking for you to be delivered from this constant cycle of failure. Lord, as, as the children of Israel, Lord, that wasn't your plan. It's not your plan for us today. Lord, deliver us. Make us the church of the living God. Light us on fire, Lord, we pray. And I ask again for these who acknowledge the need and for those who inwardly acknowledge the need, Lord, that you would just very clearly help them to see where there's a need in their life and that they would confess it, get it right, deal with it, Lord, before the God of heaven, get the cleansing and move on with victory. Lord, thank you that you didn't make it difficult, but I'm asking you for your blessing that we bring here tonight. Bless them, we pray now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.